and really seeing our own self-grasping ignorance, self-centered thought as the cause of our misery, then instead of believing the stories they tell us, the, for the false stories that we're not good enough, that we're a nuisance to other people, that people don't like us, all this kind of stuff. Let's see that those kind of put-down thoughts are just total fabrications, not having any basis in reality. And so instead of nurturing them and having them impede our happiness as well as our progress on the path, let's realize them as false thoughts for what they are. <coughs> and instead see that we have the seeds of love and compassion in our hearts and cultivate those seeds so that we can relate to people in a very different way. And then with that kind of mind, progress on the path to full awakening. Okay, so there are a few questions. So, do Buddhists still create unpolluted karma? If so, what would be the ripening results they would experience in regards to their powers, fearlessness, and perfect qualities? No, the Buddhists do not uh, create unpolluted karma. Yeah, the um, eighth, ninth, and tenth level bodhisattvas do. I think actually from path of seeing onwards, I think they, the the uh, Aryas who are not Buddhas create unpolluted karma. When you get to Buddhahood, it's called Trinle. Le is that same word for action or karma, but Trinle is the Buddha's, um, uh, you know, I influential qualities, the Buddha's uh, enlightened or awakened activities. Yeah, and so whereas karma, you know, you have an in intention right before it um, with the Buddha's activities, then you, you know, an Arya has uh, generated those intentions so much and there's no more self-grasping or self-centeredness in the mind to impede the uh, momentum of those intentions, you know, so it just becomes awakened activity. It isn't karma. And it, it is spontaneous, so it doesn't have the force of a, an intention that, you know, you deliberately cultivate. <coughs> okay, is that clear for people? So Buddhas are not under the influence of karma. Yeah, and there's no way for Buddhas to lose their realizations. Yeah, because once you've eliminated all faults and gained all uh, realizations and knowledge, there's no way to become ignorant again. <laughs> okay, once you've eliminated even the seeds of self-centeredness, there's no way to become self-centered again. Okay, so that's why, you know, with ignorance as the root of samsara, when that's cut, you know, when you pull up the knapweed by the roots, that plant can no longer grow. Okay, so it's, it's the same with uprooting the ignorance in our mind. There's no way to lose those realizations and start creating karma again or anything like that. Okay, then there's a question. Emergence is the way to come out of meditative absorption after having entered it. Would you explain the process of emergence? I think it's, it's, it must be, I'm guessing here. Um, like, you know, when you're a Dharma practitioner, how you train yourself to wake up in the morning? 
Yeah, isn't there a way you train yourself to wake up in the morning? Yeah, kind of what to think about, where to put your direction. You know, you just kind of don't wake up the same old way and go, uh, yeah. Um, so here it's coming out of it. You know, when they go into very deep states of samadhi, before they go in, they make a determination of how long they're going to stay in the in the states of concentration. Yeah, because you know when when the gross consciousnesses are absorbed, you don't look at your uh, clock in the <laughs> middle of the meditation session to see if you've been in samadhi long enough. You know, you decide beforehand, you make a decision, and then you go into the meditation, and then, you know, it's you come out at the proper time. Um, but the way you come out, you know, do you just jump up from your meditation session and, and start thinking about what you're going to cook for lunch? Um, you know, I imagine it, it involves some skill coming out of those those deep states not to jar your experience. And also for the, um, the Buddhist, uh, you know, meditators who are coming out of samadhi, they, it's a very, very good time uh, to apply insight. Yeah, now this is, this is according to the Pali tradition, okay? Because this, this was mentioned <coughs> this thing of emergence was mentioned in the context of the Pali. So, um, because at that time when you come out of the samadhi, then you, you know, your mind is still uh, fairly concentrated and very, um, you know, not filled with all sorts of rubbish. And so then you look back on on the samadhi and all the different factors that were involved, mental factors and, you know, the position of the, you know, all the aggregate factors that were involved in being in that samadhi. And then you reflect that uh, none of those are a self and there's no self existing within the collection of those factors. So in that way you bring um, insight into your meditation and, and you develop insight that way. Okay. And then uh, thank you for the thing on the Kadampa. I'll take it and read it first before I, yeah. Okay. Okay, so we stop we did the f the six unshared behaviors, right? Out of the 18 um, unshared qualities of the Buddha that, that the Buddha has that our hearts don't have. And I really want to emphasize with all these things, you know, in your morning and evening meditations, this is what you should be meditating on, you know, in the time instead of doing Lam Rim per se, this is Lam Rim, you know, um, so contemplating these things. And especially when you meditate on these qualities, like we did yesterday in class, think of what it would be like with somebody who had those qualities and how much that person could influence you in a good way. And then think of what it would be like if you had those qualities and you know how you could then do so much good in the world and how happy you would be, okay? And so meditating like that, it gives you a much richer feeling of what the Sangha refuge is, or in this case, actually, what the Buddha refuge is, okay? The Sangha, the ones who are developing those qualities, they don't have them all, but, you know, the Buddha has all of these to the fullest extent. So it gives you a, f a fuller idea of what Buddhahood is, and it gives you a better idea of what you want to cultivate in your practice. You know where you're going, you know. So when we say, I want to become Buddha, uh, you know, you're not thinking, I want to be a statue on the altar. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, we need to have some idea of, of what a Buddha is 
and how those qualities link with our very human qualities right now, yeah, except they're extensions of our human qualities in a perfect state, unimpeded by the self-centeredness and the self-grasping ignorance that impede us right now. Okay, so really meditating like that um, in your sessions, it, it will help your, your refuge. Yeah, and be very inspiring. Very inspiring. Yeah, because if you don't meditate like that and you just take these lists, you know, then it just becomes like information. And then you say, well, this is all in these treatises, but how do these treatises relate to my practice? Yeah, and so you're completely missing out on how, th you know, what's in the treatises relate to our practice. Okay? Because His Holiness always says that we shouldn't see the philosophical treatises as one thing and then practice manuals as another thing. You know, we study those, we meditate on those. But to see that everything we learn in some way or another should inform our meditation. Okay, so the six unshared realizations. So one, due to his all-encompassing love and compassion, a Buddha never experiences any decline of his aspiration and intention to benefit all sentient beings and to increase their virtuous qualities. Okay. Now, wouldn't it be nice to be around somebody <laughs> who had that intention to benefit you all the time and it never declined? And wouldn't it be nice from your side, you know, to always have that feeling of love and compassion and the wish to benefit? And it never declines, yeah? Because we kind of generate bodhicitta, you know, in our meditations and so on. And then as soon as we're off the cushion, it's like, <sighs> These sentient beings, you know, they're just such a pain in the tush. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I have love and compassion for all of them. <sighs> I hope they realize how kind I am to them. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, our love and compassion really decline, don't they? <laughs> okay, then two, he never loses joyous effort to lead others to awakening. A Buddha experiences no physical, verbal, or mental fatigue and continuously cares for the welfare of sentient beings without getting tired, lazy, or despondent. Oh, do they have, like, pills with that? <laughs> I could use some of that sometimes, you know? So imagine that, uh, you know, there's, you never lose your, you have these realizations that don't decline. You never lose them. And then you never get tired physically, verbally, mentally, and say, I'm just exhausted. Oh, give me a break, you know, or despondent. Oh, these students, again, you know, I asked them where we left off in the text and they don't know. <laughs> okay. Then three, a Buddha's mindfulness effortlessly remains constant and uninterrupted. He is mindful also of the situations each sentient being encounters in the past, present, and future, and the methods to subdue and help them. Okay, so mindfulness or memory, yeah, remains constant and uninterrupted. So the Buddha is always aware of, you know, the the values, the precepts, the the four establishments of mindfulness, and this occurs effortlessly. Yeah. And then he's also mindful or aware <laughs> of the situations that sentient beings encounter in the past, present, and future. And then, of course, the methods to help them 
So if sentient beings are having difficulties, what to, you know, do to help them to come out of those difficulties? Yeah, whether sentient beings pick up on the Buddha's aid is a whole other ball game. But from the Buddha's side, that's going on. Then four, he continuously remains in samadhi, free from all obscurations and focused on the ultimate reality. So in addition to working for sentient beings on the conventional level, yeah, the Buddha can remain in uh, meditative equipoise on emptiness and so perceive ultimate truth and conventional truth at the same time. So only a Buddha can do that. Okay, and then uh, five, his wisdom is inexhaustible and never declines. He perfectly knows the 84,000 Dharma teachings and the doctrines of the three vehicles, as well as how and when to express them to sentient beings. Okay, so the Buddha knows all the paths and stages and doesn't forget them. Yeah, we study something, we learn it, maybe we even take an exam, and then a few months later it was like, what are the qualities of the first Bhumi? I forget. Yeah, uh, so this never leaves the Buddha's mind. And then also this, uh, you know, intuitive feeling. Again, it's not even intuition, it's just autom automatic skill of when to express uh, the teachings and the doctrines and to whom and how to do it. Yeah. So we usually need to plan, you know, <laughs> before we give a BBC, we write it all out and we practice it and then we have the paper in front of us and, you know, uh, whereas a Buddha, it just kind of comes out spontaneously like that. And then six, it is impossible for him to lose the state of full awakening, free from all obscurations. He knows the mind to be naturally luminous, but and he lacks any dualistic appearance or grasping at duality. Okay, so that's what I was saying at the beginning of the session, that once you're uh, fully awakened and all everything to be abandoned has been abandoned, everything to be realized has been realized and cultivated. There's no way to lose that because there's no cause to lose it. There's nothing that can make you, you still have ignorance in your mind. Then your afflictions can arise again. Yeah, If you're still vulnerable to the ca polluted karma, then you can still be reborn again. But the Buddha has eliminated all of that. So there's no cause that would, you know, cause any decrease in realizations or qualities or, uh, you know, make him lose the uh, enlightenment. Okay, then the three unshared awakening activities. So this is the Trinle, yeah, the awakening activities that the Buddha does in place of creating karma. Okay, so first, imbued with exalted wisdom, a Buddha's physical actions are always done for the benefit of others. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, he emanates many bodies that appear wherever sentient beings have the karma to be led on the path to awakening. Whatever a Buddha does has a positive effect on sentient beings, subduing their mind. So physically, you know, the Buddha can do all these quali all these things. Now, this sounds very Mahayana here. You know, he men emanates many bodies that appear wherever sentient beings, you know, have the karma to be benefited. But even uh, from the viewpoint of the Pali tradition, you know, if the Buddha has this bodhicitta motivation to benefit and has the cycl cyclic psychic power, the super knowledge, to be em able to emanate many bodies, then you put the two together and this happens. Yeah. So you see, you know, this is expressed in a way that, that oh, you know, that Pali tradition people can accept it. But then you look and there's just a very short step from that to talking about 
the emanation body of a Buddha, you know, when a, and the speaking and getting into the whole discussion of the four kayas of a Buddha. They're not, you know, it's not like there's huge oceans between the Pali and the Sanskrit traditions. And if you really look well, you can see how what is uh, in, the, in the Sanskrit tradition is usually the same thing in the Pali tradition, only amplified or deepened or explained more vastly. Yeah. You know, when it comes to exactly what selflessness is, there's some, some difference there. Yeah, but on many of these kinds of qualities, they're just extensions. And even when you come to meditating on selflessness, and we will come to that section, many of the meditations are exactly the same as we learn from uh, Nagarjuna and Chandakirti. Yeah, it's just maybe the object of negation might be uh, expressed in different ways. Okay, then two, knowing the dispositions and interests of each sentient being, he teaches the Dharma in a manner appropriate for that person. His speech flows smoothly, is accurate, and lovely to listen to. It does not deceive or lead others astray, but is clear, knowledgeable, and kind. Wouldn't it be nice to have speech like that? Yeah? So whenever you open your mouth, people are like, ready to listen and whatever you say is a benefit to them. Mm -hmm. So that when people see us coming, they, they go, oh, nice, I get to hear something good. Instead of, oh, that angersome person is coming. How, to how can I get out of the room? <laughs> okay. And then three, filled with undeclining love and compassion. His mind encompasses all beings with the intention to do only what is of the highest benefit. He is effortlessly and continuously cognizant of all phenomena. Okay, so, um, you know, only has the intention to benefit. And then effortlessly and continuously cognizant of all phenomena. Um, Actually, the, the Pali would not say it exactly like that, okay? Because they say the Buddha, yes, has, th this would be according to the Sanskrit, but they say the Buddha has all-knowing, but to know an object, he has to turn his attention to it. So it isn't continuous. Yeah, and the Buddha has to turn his attention to that. Okay, and then the the three exalted wisdoms. So those were the three unshared awakening activities of body, speech, and mind. And then the three exalted wisdoms. Okay, um, a Buddha's exalted wisdom knows everything in the three times, the past, the present, and the future. So those are the three. Without any obscuration or error. His knowledge of the future does not mean that things are predetermined. So this is important. Rather, a Buddha knows that if a sentient being does a particular action, this particular result will follow. And if another course of action is taken, a different result will come. Okay? So he knows all Buddha fields and realms of sentient beings as well as the beings and their activities there. Okay? So lots of times people hear, oh, the Buddha knows the future, then we think, oh, the future must be predetermined. It's interesting, in, in you know, all the Indian treatises, they never uh, deal with the issue of free will and predetermination. It never came up, whereas in Christian cultures, theistic cultures, it's a huge issue, isn't it? Yeah, discussed so much. Because in a theistic culture, if God is the creator and God is omnipotent, yeah, then God has it planned out 
and God can control everything, so how much free will do we have or is it all predetermined by God? Because that reason is, is very often used to comfort people. You know, why did this child die? It was God's will. Yeah, it was predetermined by God. Yeah, and it's a mystery beyond our knowledge. Yeah, and, and so that is used as a way to comfort people for things that they can't otherwise understand. That really are totally un, 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 un understandable from the viewpoint of if you create and um, uh, have the concept of uh, an, uh, an omniscient and omnipotent creator. Yeah. Whereas if you believe in dependent arising, then you know that certain causes lead to certain effects, you know, and those effects again become causes that when combined with other conditions will lead to other effects. But it doesn't mean that everything is pre-planned. Yeah, it just means that in the case of a Buddha knowing this, you know, if you do this, this result comes. If you do that, that result comes. Yeah, but sentient beings, you know, what pops up in our mind? Yeah, isn't pre-planned, is it? It's conditioned. But it's not pre-planned. Yeah, it's not predetermined. So that's the element of responsibility that we have for our own situation. You know, so when we face difficulties, to to really say, you know, this is due to my own faulty choices. And if I don't like the situation I'm in, I need to change the choices I make and the actions I do. Okay, right now I'm uh, going, I'm correcting the manuscript of the Wheel of Sharp Weapons. And this is one of the main points of the text. Yeah, and it's a beautiful point because it means we can create the cause for the kind of future we want to have. Yeah. And it also frees us from blaming other people. <laughs> yeah, of course, part of us likes blaming other people because if it's other people's fault, then, you know, I'm a victim. I don't have to do anything except feel sorry for myself. And the world has to change, yeah, for me to be happy. And But I don't have to do anything because it's, you know, it's not my problem. I'm unhappy and it's not my problem. It's other because of what other people do. Yeah. But that kind of view on one hand, you know, freeing us from a, a responsibility. On the other hand, frees us from responsibility and means we can't do anything to change our our own situation. And that really stinks, doesn't it? If you, if you're sitting there as a victim who can't do anything to change uh, your own situation. That's really bad. So, uh, yeah. So Buddhism doesn't have that, that kind of view at all. So re having the responsibility for something doesn't mean it's someone's fault. I think the word fault, you know, someone's fault or blame, I think we should scratch those words and concepts out. Yeah, because there's, you can't say it's somebody's fault. Fault implies that the person's a bad person, doesn't it? Responsibility just implies to me anyway, somebody made an unwise decision and they can change it. Yeah. Blaming somebody means, you know, like putting it all on them. But that's very simplistic, isn't it? Because there's always more than one cause for anything that exists. 
Yeah, one cause can't bring, you know, only one cause can't bring the result. You need other causes. You need cooperative conditions. Yeah, dependent arising is very complex. Blame just implies, oh, it's all on you. That's it. <laughs> yeah, it, not correct. Reading such passages from the sutras gives us an idea of Buddha's exceptional qualities. Contemplating them brings joy and expands our mental horizons. These passages also give us an idea of the qualities we will attain if we practice the Dharma as the Buddha instructed. Okay, so remember that. While the descriptions of the four fearlessnesses and ten powers in the Pali and Sanskrit traditions do not differ considerably, the Sanskrit traditions emphasize how these abilities benefit sentient beings. Okay, so that's, that's something important too. Okay, so now the three jewels according to the Pali tradition. Okay, all Buddhists take refuge in the three jewels and not in a particular Buddhist tradition, lineage, or individual teacher. This is very important, okay? I have people coming and saying, well, I took refuge in such and such a teacher. Yeah, as if, uh, well, then I can't have any other teachers. Or I took refuge in such and such a lineage, as if then I can't hear teachings from other lineages. Completely incorrect. You know, when you listen to the, when you say the refuge formula, it says, I take refuge in the Buddha, the supreme of all human beings. I take refuge in the Dharma, the supreme abandonment of attachment. I take refuge in the Sangha, the supreme assembly. It does not say, I take refuge in this particular teacher. I take refuge in this lineage. Yeah. And so I think this is quite important, um, you know, because there's so much sectarianism uh, in Buddhism that is really a pity. You know, it's, it's based on wrong conceptions and it's really divisive. Yeah. And you know, we take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And it's not like, you know, the Zen people have one Buddha and we have another Buddha. Yeah, <laughs> it's not like that. You know, different traditions may see the Buddha differently depending upon which scriptures they refer to. But the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha are the same. Yeah no matter how we see them. And, you know, we're taking refuge in the three jewels. Lineages were, are histories of human beings. Yeah, They're, the Buddha is the ultimate source. So this is why, you know, in the discussion of renewing the, the bhikshuni precepts when we get into there's the Dharmaguptaka Vinaya and the Malusha Fastavada Vinaya and the Pali Vinaya. And I think, you know, the Buddha didn't teach all those Vinayas. All those Vinayas are rooted in the Buddha's teachings. But the Buddha didn't say, I'm teaching the Dharmaguptaka Vinaya and then a few days later I'm teaching the Pali Vinaya. Buddha just taught Vinaya. Yeah. The lineages began when, you know, people started going in different directions, and it was an oral tradition. And so sometimes things, you know, got accidentally changed in the tradition, or sometimes somebody added something to clarify what was meant in the recitation. Yeah, but it all goes back to the Buddha, you know? So the lineages are things that came after the Buddha. And, uh, and the traditions came after the Buddha. 
Okay, and especially in the in the case of the Tibetans, um, the lineages uh, really are have much more to do with tantric practice than sutra practice. Yeah, because they're mostly differentiated according to which yogis and which tantric practices in India that the Tibetan traditions are based on. Yeah, but the sutra teachings are pretty much the same. Yeah, the Lam Rim teachings in the, in the four traditions are pretty much the same. You know, small differences here and there. Um, yeah, so this whole thing of, you know, identifying, I am a this, you know, you are a that, <laughs> is, is I, I remember one time, I'm going to go off on a little tangent here, but uh, many years ago, I was giving a talk, I think it was in North Carolina, at a Cargill Center. And uh, I gave the talk, and then afterwards, one woman came up and said to me, you know, I heard that, you know, we, we Cargills are the ones who meditate, and Galupas d just study, and they never meditate. But you couldn't have given that talk if you didn't meditate. She was so surprised, you know, I, oh, you meditate, of course I meditate, you know, <laughs> yeah, I was so surprised, yeah. so, and I remember going once other to, to, um, to one Buddhist center, again, from, from one p tradition, and the first question, because I like to go and visit people from different things, and I, um, First question when I went in the office, are, Nyingma Kargyagalu, are you Nyingma Kargyagalu or Sakya? I said, I'm a Buddhist. <laughs> the guy didn't know what to do with me. You're a Buddhist. No, you've got to be one of the four. Well, he got over that. He took me on a tour of the facility. When we got into the kitchen, he introduced me to the cook. The cook said, are you Nyingma Kargyagalu or Sakya? And the guy from the office said, oh, she says she's a Buddhist. <laughs> 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 you know, they were all so stupefied, you know. So, of course, on a personal level, I mean, I think Jay Tsongkhapa's great, yeah, and I love Jay Tsongkhapa, but I usually don't go and say I'm a Galupa because I'm not part of a religious institution, yeah. I'm a follower of the Buddha. I love Jay Tsongkhapa's teachings, but to me, when you say those things, it 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 means that you're the follower. You know, you're a member of a specific religious institution, and from the point of view of the Tibetans, you know, we Ingis, and especially nuns, are not part of their religious institution. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, initially this, I felt very um, unhappy about this. But then I realized actually it provides great freedom. Yeah? Uh, because it gives me the space to look at something and see these are the qualities that I think are very good that I want to incorporate from, uh, want to incorporate. And these are the qualities that you know, I don't want to continue. And so it's kind of the same with, um, personally speaking here, because uh, I've lived in so many countries as an adult, and I like taking what I like from each culture and putting them together, yeah? So if people ask me my nationality, I have to say I'm an American because I have that passport, yeah? But inside, what do I feel like? I'm a citizen of the planet, okay? And so in the same way, you know, I see myself as a follower of, of the Buddha. And, and also because, um, you know, in terms of monastic practice, my novice ordination was with Khyabje Ling Rinpoche in the Tibetan tradition, the, the Mula Shavastavada Vinaya. But then for full ordination, I went to China, uh, to uh, Taipei, to Taipei, to Taiwan in Kaohsiung, 
and I took my full ordination there, and I have a very close connection with, uh, you know, Chinese Buddhism. And so my Vinaya teachers, my Vinaya lineage, you could say, you know, stems from, uh, you know, my Chinese teachers. And so they're the ones that guide me in terms of Dharma, you know, in terms of uh, Vinaya. So, you know, and for me, that works perfectly well. I don't see any problem or any contradiction at all, you know. I find that some of my friends, because they're Tibetan practitioners, they want to be bhikshunis in the, in the Mulachavastavada Vinaya, because that's the one practiced uh, by the Tibetans. But for me, that, that's not a, a, a big thing. I'm, you know, Dharma Guptaka came from Vinaya, came from the Buddha too, and it's the one that has the bhikshuni lineage or the bhikshuni ordination, I should say, and so fine to, to practice that, yeah? So. Mm -hmm. How about, you know, they look in yourself to as the master, as the Buddha did, and then, so it's good, they look to roll off after some part of Right, so right. You Yeah, Tsongkhapa was the, was the great non-sectarian person. And then his followers made it into a tradition. And, you know, if you're a real Tsongkhapa follower, you, mm, mm, you know. But Tsongkhapa himself wasn't that way. Yeah. So, and I don't think any of the founders of the different lineages had the intention to start a lineage or start a tradition, or separate themselves out from others. They were just passing things on. You know, in the same way when you look at the, the founders of the world's great religions, do you think Jesus had, had the idea to start a religion? Especially one that developed into what Christianity is today? I don't think so. Yeah. Did Mohammed have the idea to start a religion? Did Moses have the idea to start a religion? You know, I think these were just people who, you know, were, were leaders, very spiritual people who were leaders, who taught, and then later generations made these into religions. You know? And then as human beings go, we like to subdivide everything you know, closer and closer to get it into ma me. Yeah. His Holiness is great when he, he talks to the Tibetans. He says, how does he say it? It's so good. Okay. Like all the religions are very good, but Buddhism's best. And all, all of Buddhism is good, but Tibetan Buddhism is best. And all of, of Tibetan Buddhism is good, but my tradition is best. And all of my tradition is good, but my monastic college is best. Mm -hmm. And all of the monastic colleges are very good, but, um, you know, my Kamsen is the best one. And all the people in my Kamsen are very good, but I'm the best one. <laughs> 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 you know? <laughs> it always comes down like that, doesn't it, you know? It's all ways of individuating the I, <laughs> you know? So um, I think, uh, you know, we should try and chill out on this a bit, <laughs> yeah? And, uh, you know, be much more open-minded and learn from others, okay? Yeah. Yeah, I don't use the term Hinayana. Nobody says I'm a Hinayanist. Mm -hmm. Nobody self-identifies as a Hinayanist. Yeah, I would say I'm Buddhist. I favor the Mahayana tradition. But, you know, in, in doing this book, I had to do a lot of research on, on Theravada. 
and wow, it's quite amazing. And I really see that my, limb pra my Lamrim practice is based on the Pali tradition. I can't separate my Lamrim practice from the Pali tradition. Okay? So, if I did, you know, because some people who say I'm Mahayana, like Mahayana has nothing to do with the Pali tradition, those people don't understand properly that Mahayana is based on the Pali, what's taught in the Pali suttas. And what's taught in the Pali suttas is contained in the canons in Tibet and China. Yeah. So it's not that these things are totally different religions like that. Okay. Yeah. And especially when you study the history, you know, like the term Theravada, it came centuries after the Buddha. The term Mahayana also many centuries later. Yeah. So people, you know, probably at the time of the Buddha, th well they would say, who are you the disciple of? Yeah, I'm the disciple of the Buddha. That sounds really cool, doesn't it? You know, to really think, I'm a disciple of the Buddha. That's it. But that's a big responsibility, being a disciple of the Buddha, isn't it? Yeah, it's a big responsibility. Our refuge is in general, uh, is in general, the three jewels. The Pali traditions and the Sanskrit traditions descriptions of the three jewels contain many common points as well as points unique to each tradition. First, we'll examine the Pali tradition. Okay, so common points, different points. What else is new? Yeah? <laughs> so the Buddha jewel is the historical Buddha who lived approximately 2,600 years ago and turned the Dhamma wheel for the benefit of sentient beings. To refer to himself, the Buddha frequently used the term Tathagata, the one thus gone, because he has gone to nirvana, the unconditioned state, by, perfect by perfecting serenity and insights, the paths and the fruits. So Tathagata was a common term used in India at the time. Yeah, it wasn't a specifically Buddhist term. You know, nor was samsara or liberation, moksha or nirvana. All of these were common terms um, to all the spiritual paths, especially those of the wandering ascetics at the time of the Buddha. Okay. So Tathagata also means the one thus come, meaning the Buddha has come to Nibbana in the same way all the previous Buddhas have, by perfecting the 37 aids to awakening, completing the ten perfections, giving away his body and possessions and charity to others, and acting for the welfare of the world. Okay. A Tathagata has fully awakened to the nature of this world, its origins, its cessations, uh, its cessation, and the way to its cessation. So fully awakened to the four truths. Okay. He has fully understood and can directly perceive all things that can be seen, heard, sensed, known, cognized, and thought about, knowing them just as they are. Everything a Tathagata says is true and correct. His words and actions accord with each other. He is free from hypocrisy. He has conquered the foes of the afflictions that's actually the uh, etymology of arhat. An arhat is a foe destroyer, meaning conquered the foes of the afflictions. Uh, so he has conquered the foes of the afflictions and is not conquered by them. Thereby he possesses great power to benefit the world. The Tathagata has realized two great principles, 
dependent arising and nibbana. Okay? Dependent arising applies to the entirety of the conditioned world of samsara, of true dukkha and true origins. All worldly things arise dependent on their specific conditions and are impermanent. Nibbana the, is the unconditioned, true cessation, which is realized by true paths. Together, dependent arising and Nibbana include all existence, so understanding them is understanding all existence. Okay? So here you have, you know, things, all existence divided into de things that are dependent arisings and Nibbana. H now here is where you will find a difference with the Madhyamaka school in the, in the Sanskrit tradition. Yeah? Because here dependent arising is seen in terms of causal dependence only. And so the conditioned world of samsara is dependent arising, yeah. The awakened sphere of Nibbana is permanent and is not dependent arising. It's beyond this conditioned world. You know, from a uh, Prasangika viewpoint, even the, um, the unconditioned is dependent, not causally dependent, but mutually dependent and dependent on being uh, fabricated by terms and concepts, okay? By being designated, you know, by terms and concepts. So the Madhyamaka has a, a bit of a different view on this, yeah? And so, uh, you know, from in the Theravada, they condition, they see all condition things as something that you want to get rid of. That was a big bird, huh? Um, that is so all condition things as something you want to get rid of because they see all condition things as under the influence of ignorance. So when I was there in Taiwan, I asked the, the Theravada teacher, in, uh, in Thailand, sorry, in Thailand. I asked the Theravada teacher there. Um, uh, I can just <laughs> flat. Yeah, I asked, well, what about the Buddha's wisdom? You know, isn't that something dependent? Yeah, isn't it impermanent? And he said, yes, you know, it, it's something dependent, but that's not included in, when we say condition things, we're referring only to things conditioned by ignorance. Yeah, so it isn't like on a, you know, on a philosophical basis, he would then say, oh yeah, the Buddha's wisdom is permanent. He wouldn't say that, yeah. But he wouldn't say the Buddha's wisdom is is dependent arising and impermanent in terms of, Im because impermanent is usually one of the three characteristics of polluted phenomena. You know, they're impermanent, the nature of dukkha, and uh, with no self, not self, okay? So uh, it's not like you can catch them in a philosophical debate and say, Tha! You're saying, you know, the Buddha's speech is is permanent or, you know, is, is defiled because you said it was impermanent. No, no, they're not saying that. It's just the way they use the words. It's different. Okay. Okay. The Buddha is praised as the one who actualized the Dhamma and taught it to others. A famous passage in the Pali Canon describes the relationship of the Dhamma and the Buddha. When speaking to the monk of Akali, who was gravely ill and regretted not having been able to see the Buddha sooner, 
the Buddha replied, you know, because this monk, you know, like, oh, I always, I want to see the Buddha, I want to see the Buddha, and never got to see the Buddha, and then the Buddha's there when he dies. I mean, lucky him, isn't he? You know, and then he's he's spending his last moment just saying, oh, I wish I had met you earlier. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and the Buddha spoke to him, and he said, enough, Vakali. I mean, Buddha didn't say, poor guy, you're dying. He said, enough, cut it out. Why do you want to see this foul body? One who sees the Dhamma sees me. One who sees me sees the Dhamma. Okay, so here again, there's a difference between how the Buddha is seen. Yeah, the Buddha is calling his body a foul body. The idea being that when he was born in that last lifetime, he was born, he was still an ordinary being. And then he became fully awakened in that lifetime, but he still had the body that was initially uh, caused by uh, afflictions and karma. So he called it a foul body. From the viewpoint of the Mahayana, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha was enlightened many eons ago, and this is an emanation body that is appearing, you know, solely for the benefit of sentient beings and is not under the influence of afflictions and karma, and so is not a foul body. Okay, so here you have one difference in how the Buddha is seen. That's not the point of this quotation, though. Okay, the quotation, one who sees the Dhamma sees me. One who sees me sees the Dhamma. Okay, so when he's, he's saying, you know, for Vakali, you know, just wanted to see the Buddha, the Buddha with the Buddha's, and the Buddha's saying, listen, this, you know, this body is just, it's a foul body. It's a samsaric body. Why do you want to see that? Seeing this body has nothing to do with seeing the Tathagata. Yeah? Seeing the Dhamma, mean, meaning understanding the Four Noble Truths, understanding Nibbana, you know, gaining that wisdom. If you see that, then you're seeing the Tathagata because you're seeing what the Tathagata's mind is. Yeah, so don't focus on the body, you know, of your refuge. Focus on the qualities, the mental qualities, especially of the refuge. Okay, so seeing and knowing the Buddha is not done physically, but through mental development. Yeah. Being close to the Buddha means actualizing the same true paths and true cessations he has. The extent to which our minds have been transformed into the Dharma is the extent to which we see the Buddha. Okay, very important. Yeah. I remember, you know, when I was a baby Buddhist nun, you know, my teacher had so many disciples and other people got to be with my teacher much more than I did. You know, we had to make appointments. You know, people like me, we had to make appointments. We had to wait a week or two. Or as he got more disciples, we had to wait a month or two for <laughs> or a year or two for an appointment. And all these other people got to be near the teacher, and I didn't get to. And, uh, you know, it was, you know, I, I want to see the teacher. And, uh, you know, it really caused a lot of anguish inside, you know, and jealousy, really yucky kind of stuff. Yeah. And then... Um, Yeah, well, w one thing that, uh, that happened is I got so fed up of, with being jealous because it was so painful that I decided I had to change. So that was one element that was very good. Uh, but then um, Lama Yeshi one time when he was teaching, he said, uh, 
you know, because I was so jealous of all these people who got to be closer to the teacher than me. And Lama said, you know, sometimes teachers keep the people who aren't, I mean, this is my language, but the meaning was his, who people who aren't very together people close to them in order to, you know, help them a lot because they need a, a lot of help. But people who are doing better and who can manage themselves, they don't keep so close to them. Yeah, because these people can manage themselves. And, and that was like, oh, okay, maybe it's not so bad after all. Because I looked at the people who were close to my teachers, and they were, some of them were the people I thought were big disasters. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sad. I'm just telling you what I was like. That's, I know it's not very nice, but, you know, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I, no, I mean, it's true that this is the way I thought. Yeah, I, I try not to think this way now, okay? Uh, I have I've worked on it a lot because it was so painful. But, um, you know, because some of these people were just like, how come Lama keeps these people by him? And then when he said that, I thought, oh, well, maybe it's not so bad that, you know, that I'm not one of those people <laughs> who get to be around the teachers all the time. Yeah, but you know, it was again this point that being close to the teacher isn't, you know, being a groupie. Yeah, and to being with the teacher all day and all night and being a groupie and seeing what the teacher does. Being close to your teacher is what's going on inside here, you know. And I remember one time, um, one song member too was teaching at Tushita, and. Uh, uh, he was one of Lama's uh, gurus, and Lama was kneeling beside uh, Sung Rinpoche and looking at him. And the way he looked at him, I could see, you know, what came into my mind is this, what makes them a close guru and disciple is bodhicitta. Because Rinpoche, Sung Rinpoche taught bodhicitta Lama practiced bodhicitta and had bodhicitta in his mind. That's what made them close. Yeah. So that's what the Buddha was pointing out to Vakali. Yeah. So if you want to be close to your teacher, cultivate those qualities. And that's the whole idea of the guru yoga practice that we do. It's not worshiping the teacher as some external being. It's cultivating those qualities within ourself. Okay, regarding this quotation, the above one, in his commentary, the Saratapakasini, uh, Buddhaghosa explains, so Buddhaghosa was the, the great fifth century uh, Pali commentator. Here the Blessed One shows himself as the Dhamma body, Dhammakaya, yeah, I read that. I went, whoa, I thought that term was only used in the Sanskrit tradition. You know, here's Buddha Gosa saying Dhammakaya. So I wonder what he means by Dhammakaya. Okay, so here the Blessed One shows himself as the Dhamma body, the Dhammakaya, as stated in the passage, the Tathagata great king is the Dhamma body. For the ninefold super mundane Dhamma, the four Ar Arya paths and their fruits and Nibbana, is called the Tathagata's body. Okay, so here we have the ninefold supreme Dharma, the four, we'll get into this, you know, later in the chapter. The um, the four approachers and the four abiders, okay, uh, that are practicing, who have realizations, and Nibbana itself, okay? And so the ninefold super mundane Dhamma consists of the four Ariyas, their paths and fruits, so which means their minds, their consciousnesses, and Nibbana, which is the object of their meditation. 
Okay, so these true cessations and true paths in the mind of a Buddha. Okay, so the not not all ninefold because the Buddha is not a stream enterer, you know, but all these realizations and the true cessations in the mind of a Buddha are his Dhammakaya. Okay, so the Dhammakaya is the highest truth and the highest attainment. Yeah, the highest truth. Yeah, so on one hand, it's the object and the highest attainment. On the other hand, you know, what you've attained. So that, and then the d they also say the Dharmakaya, um, me, you know, includes the ten powers, the four fearlessnesses, the eighteen unshared aspects. Yeah. So that is, you know, what what's the Tathagata's body? It's the true cessations and the true paths. It doesn't mean the physical body. It means you know, the, the corpus, the collection of qualities of a Buddha. And that's also the meaning of the Dhammakaya. Okay. Yeah, so very, very close to the Sanskrit tradition. Yeah, when you get into the meaning of, you know, Nibbana, then there's some differences going on there. But, you know, in general, very, very close, yeah? Then the Dhamma Jewel consists of true cessation and true paths. True cessation is the ultimate aim of spiritual practice. It is the unconditioned Nibbana, the deathless state, okay? So in the Pali tradition, very much whatever is conditioned is samsara, is bad, the unconditioned, I mean, another synonym for Nibbana is the unconditioned, the deathless, you know, that's considered the state that you want, you know. Why is it the deathless? Because you're no longer born in samsara, so you no longer have to die, okay? It's the unconditioned, it's not... Uh, it's not going to fluctuate according to afflictions and karma. So Nibbana is not produced by causes and conditions. It is not impermanent and does not change in each moment. Okay. Four synonyms of Nibbana describe it from different angles. So first, it is destruction. Okay, the destruction of ignorance, attachment, anger, and especially of craving. So here, Nirvana is the destruction, the absence of the things that cause samsara, okay? It is dispassion, the absence of attachment, desire, greed, and lust. So all that craving energy completely pacifies. It's dispassion. Yeah, the mind doesn't go off on a limb craving for stuff. It is the deathless, free from samsaric birth, aging, sickness, and death. And it is excellence, supreme, never-ending, and inexhaustible. Okay, so all those four describe Nibbana from different angles. Yeah. It's not four different nibbanas. It's four different ways of looking at what nibbana is. Okay? So very much nibbana is defined as a negative phenomenon. It's the absence of this, 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 and this. And therefore, it is supreme, never-ending, and an inexhaustible, okay? But in the Pali tradition, they don't equate, um, so we'll put it this way, selflessness is very different from Nibbana. Yeah, selflessness is a realization you gain 
before you gain nibbana. Yeah, so it's different than the layout in the Sanskrit tradition. So true paths refers to the supramundane noble eightfold path, okay, that leads to nibbana. To develop this, we first cultivate the ordinary eightfold path by practicing ethical conduct, the four establishments of mindfulness, and right and mundane right concentration. As our concentration increases and our wisdom of the body, feelings, mind, and phenomena being impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self deepens, we will reach a point where the breakthrough by wisdom arises and realizes Nibbana. Okay, so here on the path, yeah, your main object that you're meditating on to start with are the four establishments of mindfulness, which includes uh, mindfulness of the breath, you know. But the four establishments of mindfulness, yeah, you're meditating with the correct uh, mundane concentration. You're practicing ethical conduct as the foundation. Eventually, your concentration, uh, well, your concentration and the depth of your understanding of impermanence, unsatisfactory or dukkha by nature, and uh, not self, yeah, come to be completely complete. That that is said to be w a worldly realization. That's not a transcendental realization. So realizing selflessness is not a transcendental realization. But that acts, as you keep meditating, as a support, that wisdom breaks through and perceives Nibbana, which is an entirely, an entirely different level of, of objects, you know? I don't even know if they would call it, you know, it's an existent, yeah. So by meditating and, uh, and realizing the three characteristics, yeah, then the wisdom breaks through and perceives Nibbana. So they would say even at, even a stream enter, which is the lowest of the four uh, aria, arias, you know, perceives Nibbana, okay? And then as you go up on the path and from a stream enter, once returner, non-returner to an arhat, your understanding of Nibbana, your perception of Nibbana deepens, okay? But Nibbana is a completely different reality, very unlike the worldly reality, yeah? So, you know, here, like in the Sanskrit tradition, when they talk about emptiness, well, first of all, they say nirvana. Nirvana is emptiness, yeah. But they also, it's a specific kind of emptiness, yeah. We wouldn't say the emptiness of the piece of paper is nirvana, is nirvana. You wouldn't say that. But nirvana is the emptiness of the mind that's been purified of all defilements, yeah, and the realization of emptiness of all phenomena is what leads to nirvana. So there's a little bit of difference here in the descriptions of, of the two traditions. Yeah. Okay. While the mind dwells in concentration, wisdom penetrates the ultimate truth. So nirvana is called the ultimate truth. Wisdom penetrates that, okay? At that time, certain defilements are extinguished, and when one emerges from that concentration, one is an arya and a stream enterer. This concentration is praised beyond all other samadhis because it leads to lasting beneficial results, while worldly samadhis lead to rebirth 
in the material and immaterial realms. Okay. So we're going to get into another section here. Are there any questions so far? Yeah. So when they go into the deep concentrate, specifically their motivation is the determination to be free of liberation, not to just be free, to be the liberation. Oh, yeah. That's what makes the difference between it being worldly and being the... Yeah. Nirvana. Yeah, I mean, their motivation is definitely to attain nirvana. They're not just... Uh, you know, because the people who are doing worldly concentration, there are many different objects of concentration, and you aren't going to, and those people also aren't going to do be doing, th the, they do a kind of insight meditation, but just to bump up their level of concentration, they're not going to be doing, the worldly people, you know, are, are not going to be doing the kind of insight meditation that leads to liberation you know yeah because they're not going to be looking at impermanence dis unsatisfactoriness and n not self but it's part of the deeper levels of concentration a free mentor or whatever would go into the form and formless realm to deepen their understanding of it, they they could but it's not necessary you know just actualizing and sankapa agrees with this there's a, um, when you have uh, serenity, yeah, then y you, you go to the, um, serenity is not the first level of concentration. There's an a, pro a state called the uh, access concentration, yeah? So a with access concentration, you know, which is not, e which is prior to the first jhana, you can gain insight into no self, into the three characteristics. And Sankapa says you can, with that, also gain insight into emptiness. Now, in terms of the Mahayana path, because people want to become Buddhists, they want to master all these other things, levels of concentration. For somebody on the Arhat path, according to the Pali tradition, some people may choose to uh, actually, you know, uh, get the other levels of concentration, and some people may not. Mm -hmm. It's completely up to the individual. Not necessary for the Arhatship. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Buddha, but it's to know all these of yeah, the because if you're going to guide all sentient beings, you have to have known and experienced everything yourself. Um, the it's a reality, it's also a mental state. This is what's tricky, actually, in both traditions. Both traditions, on one, on one, in some contexts, talk about nirvana as being a reality you know, the, ter the, the Pali tradition isn't real clear on what it means uh, when it says a reality. The uh, Sanskrit tradition is very clear. It's a kind of emptiness, mm -hmm. okay? But, um, but also both traditions describe nirvana as the absence of uh, ignorance, afflictions, and polluted karma. So then this debate arises in the Sanskrit tradition. It did, does not come up in the Pali tradition, but in the Sanskrit tradition. Is Nirvana the, uh, the a, um, it's an, a, um, an implic implicative negative, a non-affirming negation, or I mean an affirming negation, or is it a non-affirming negation? Because saying that nirvana is the emptiness of ignorance of afflictions and karma would be an affirming negation, okay? And which would make it a jikpa. Yeah, a having ceased of something. Yeah, 
whereas saying that it's the emptiness of inherent existence is definitely a non-affirming ne negative. So both traditions describe it in one some contexts in this way, in some contexts this way. Yeah, both of them in the end tend to go more towards the non-affirming negation. But the Pali tradition doesn't use that kind of language of, you know, they, they I, you know, they're kind of um, uh, Abhidharma, I don't think, got into, you know, because these terms came about more with Dinaga, uh, Dharmakirti, and so on, yeah, who were later, Buddhism had already gone to uh, Sri Lanka before that. So they weren't really influenced by uh, those Indian sages so much. Or, or maybe they were in the Abhayagiri and uh, Amaravati, but, uh, you know, the Mahavihara <laughs> didn't like that and it got canceled out. Yeah. I mean, we uh, it'd be very interesting to know the history of some of these things, but it's it's quite difficult to actually find evidence because all the things, y you know, I mean, the artwork, some of it may remain, but the scriptures were mostly written on, you know, palm leaves and disintegrated. <laughs>